This morning, uh, I'll, I'll preach uh, a message, and the title of the message that uh, I'll be preaching is really, it's a question, and the title is this, Will There Be a Harvest? Will There Be a Harvest? And I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 4. We'll read these verses, 30, 34 through 38. And if you will, I'll ask you to stand just in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible word. Verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I say unto you, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you are entered into their labor. Father, we ask for the blessing of God to rest upon your word. And Lord, it always does. Father, it's not some man that his fancy way of saying or anything. Lord, it's your word, Lord, that pierces our heart and touches us. And Father, I pray that this morning that your word does exactly what it's intended to do and to touch our hearts, oh God, is our prayer. Father, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. And, and you could you could be seated. God has left the work of the harvest to saved believers. That is his church today. Now the question uh, asked, will there be a harvest? And the answer to that, definitely yes. The Lord Jesus Christ will have a harvest. He, he is reaping souls. But now the question that I propose this morning in the title is this. Will there be a harvest in your life? Will there be a harvest in this church locally? Will, will, will God have his way in your life and will God have his way in this church? I am convinced that the Bible believing, Bible teaching, God loving churches in America is the only salvation that this nation is gonna have. It's quite obvious politically we don't have the answers. It's quite honor. It's, it's quite obvious that in the social life you, it's just not there. You're not going to find because everything leads away from what is true and what is right in God's eyes. Our nation has drifted far. You say, how'd that happen? It happened little by little by little. A little bit here and a little bit there. And the first thing you know, you wake up one morning and it don't even look like what it used to. Now, all of you people who've been in the way of the Lord for a long time, you've been, in, you've been a Christian a long time, you recognize a great moving away in our nation. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a time that our communities are more ripe, now listen, is more ripe for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ than today? Are, are, has there ever been a time when they were more, now they, be, they might have been more willing in other times, but I don't know that they've been riper. Why? Because there is a desperate need for people to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today. You know, we have so many problems in America. It seems like the drug problem right now is one that is noticed quite a bit. People are so uh, dependent. Why are they dependent? Because number one, I think they're disillusioned with life. I think they're uh, troubled by life. They see uh, so many things happening in the social world. And another thing that contributes to it is the fact that we have immediate communication with whatever goes on around the world. You, in other words, you can turn the TV on, you can see instantly what happens in Sydney, Australia, what happens in China, what happens anywhere that CNN or any other news channel can get their cameras. And you, you're having to deal with all that information. Some people just have a hard time handling all that information. And also you, you find that people find themselves very stressed because of what's going on. And then, then they see people living a certain lifestyle. Oh, why can't I have that lifestyle? 
why, why, why can't I live like that? I, I'm just as good as they are. Why can't I do that? And the first thing you know, they try all kinds of experimentations trying to find certain peace and, and a certain happiness in this life. I will tell you, and you that's born again believers, you know for sure that you'll find peace one place and that peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. You won't find it out here looking in the world and looking in these things. And our focus needs to be there rather than looking for the world to satisfy these needs. Now, we, we do have an, an epidemic of uh, drug abuse and, and who's to blame? There's a lot of, you can point your fingers a lot of places, but I'm telling you for sure that those people made decisions. But those people made decisions because there was discouragement or disillusionment or something going on inside them that caused that. And so there is a need in the heart and lives of people. I'd say, to church, we need to do everything we can. And what can we do? And, you know, I just feel like that if we're true believers, that we should spend our time and our talent and our, our, our money, the church, in order to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. I guarantee you there's nothing make you any more happier than to know that you were instrumental in leading someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. To know that someone uh, was brought to the Lord Jesus because of you. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. If there's going to be a harvest in your life, and if there's going to be a harvest of souls in Biltmore Baptist Church, here's two things that will need to take place. And that is that you'll have to see the possibility. You'll have to see the possibility of a harvest. That harvest, you'll have to realize there is a harvest out there. And I've just to give you enough information to explain that you should see that yes, there is a need and there is a harvest. And then the second thing will have to happen is that you will have to seize the opportunity. Seeing the need is one thing, and then you seizing the opportunity to go take care of that is another thing. And a lot of times we find ourselves not seizing the opportunity. My prayer this morning, I'm asking, will there be a harvest? And I ask in my own life, will there be a harvest? Lord, will you, will you use me, this feeble human being that is so backward and so timid? And as a little boy, I was, I was so timid. I was hardly want to talk to nobody because I was so timid and backward. And Lord, can you use this little old country boy to win somebody. If you can, praise your holy name because I know it's the Holy Spirit of God that does it and not me. We need to get over fear. We need to get over that and say, Lord, I am yours. You use me as you see fit. Just give me wisdom enough to understand how you want to use me in this harvest. And I, I, let me say this morning that I want to give you three truths that I can see here in our text. Three truths that, that should help motivate you and me in witnessing for Christ. Some of you says, well, you know, I have a hard time keeping it straight in my brain. I have a hard time keeping my, myself, my life right with the Lord. How to work and I'm witness with somebody else. Well, I'm telling you, we just need to get over that stuff and go ahead and trust God all the way and go ahead and do what God said do. And you'll find that there is a strength that you know nothing of that God will put in you if you'll only, if you'll only Surrender that to the Lord. First, I want you to notice that the food that should motivate you, the food that should motivate you. Look, if you will, in verse, in, 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 in verse 34, Jesus said to them, my meat, in other words, the original language, that word is food. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus Christ had one thing in mind. Jesus Christ had a harvest of souls on his mind while he was here. Now, in the fourth, in the earlier part of the chapter, you'll find that Jesus had left from Jerusalem because the, the, the Pharisees was, was, was trying to find some way to trick him and just putting all kinds of uh, stuff against him. And the Bible says that he left from, he left from Jerusalem. He came through Judea. And then he come into Samaria. He said, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, uh, in that time, the Samaritans were what we call half-breeds. They had uh, some, uh, during the, during the, in the northern kingdom, after the split of Israel, uh, some of them had intermarried with the Assyrians, and those people looked as, as outcasts. And the Jews 
did not have anything to do with them. They just didn't associate with them that much. And so Samaria, Samaria was right here close to, to, uh, to, to Israel. And so he wanted to go to Galilee. He said, well, I'm going to Galilee, but I must needs go through Samaria. I need to go that way. Now, when, a, when a, 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 a Jew wanted to go and didn't want to have anything to do with Samaritans, there was other ways he could go. He'd go down by the coast to go up. Or he could, he could go across the Jordan River and go up on that side and get to Galilee without going to. And that's the way they normally went. But Jesus said, no, I got to go. I, I need to go through Samaria. And, and I often, I, I, two or three thoughts come to my mind uh, when I noticed that. And I said, you know what? That's sometimes that's what we do. We will sidestep our problems and our issues instead of going straight ahead and dealing with our issues and, and we'll bypass those issues. And Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria because he knew what he was going to do. He knew, that there was a, he knew that there was a soul in there. He knew there was people there that needed salvation. Now, Jesus came to save the whole world. And another lesson we can see in this is that Jesus was not prejudiced. There may be some of you here sitting in my sound of my voice this morning, or maybe you'll hear this message on the internet, who are prejudiced. You are so prejudiced. I want you to know Jesus was not prejudiced. Jesus went straight through into Samaria. He came, he came to a town called Sachar there, and there was where Jacob's well was. Because this lady said our father, Jacob, was the one who dug this well and gave to us. And Jesus said, well, I need a drink of water. Well, how come you're going to ask me, a Samaritan, and a man and a woman? Now, two things didn't happen. Uh, a Jew didn't ask the woman nothing, and especially if she was Samaritan. And so this woman was amazed. What's going on here? She sa he, he said to her, if you take a drink of the water that I've got, you'll never thirst again. And we know that. We've experienced that. But here is what she said. She said it from a fleshly, earthly side. She said, Lord, give me this water. That way I won't have to, I won't get thirsty anymore and I won't have to come here and draw water out of the well no more. So because she had not transferred it from, from a earthly viewpoint to a spiritual standpoint. But then Jesus brought up her sin. You, you, go, you go get your husband and bring him back and then, then we'll talk. Then I'll give you some of this water I'm talking about. She said, oh, I don't have a husband. She said, you're exactly right, you don't. She said, you've had five. She'd been married five times, and now the one you're living with now ain't your husband. So what did Jesus do? He brought up her sin to her because there has to be conviction. There'll be no salvation until there's conviction. Jesus brought her conviction. She recognized whenever he knew her whole heart, everything about her, he was more than a prophet. He was greater than the prophet. She said, I perceive you're a prophet of some kind. You're a rabbi of some kind for sure. But then she's not recognized, you are the Christ. And she had a testimony after, after she realized and God touched her heart. So look here, there is, there is food that should motivate us. Now what is that food? That food is that I want to do more than anything, I want to do the will of God. My prayer is that you sitting here in the sound of my voice this morning, that your desire more than anything else on this world and in this earth is that you want to do God's will. Some of you can't do that. Some of you can't say that. I, I, I would dare say some of you, you're just, you're just barely hanging on, hoping one day to get the glory, if you possibly can. Somehow or another, you're hanging on just barely enough so you can get to heaven. Well, you're missing the whole point. You, you, Jesus wants you to do his will. I'll tell you a good prayer to pray. Here's the prayer. Lord, I want to do your will even when I don't know what your will is for my life. Uh, that's what I desire. I want your will no matter what. And I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Listen, the, Jesus' food was to do the will of God and to finish the work. Well, now that was what he wanted more than he wanted the earthly food. He wanted the heavenly strength of food. That should be our desire as Christians. We need to have this desire, burning desire. Why? Because there's a lost world out there that needs, that needs to know Jesus. I want you to know the second thing that I see is the fields. Not only the food should motivate you, but the fields should motivate you. Notice what, notice what he says in verse 35. 
He said, he said, say ye not that there are yet four months. Then comes the harvest. Now more than likely at the time of the year, they had just put the seed in the ground. And they have to wait a little while till the fruit comes up, grain comes up, then the harvest is ready. But Jesus said, I'm telling you, he said, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Why, why was he lifting up your eyes? Because if you know the story here, the lady had gone into the town and excited, I have found the Christ, I found the Messiah. Comes and some of them begin to come to hear Jesus. So more than likely what was happening, Jesus saw this group of people coming up the road toward where the well was. And Jesus said to them, lift up your, look up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are, for they are white already under harvest. In other words, the harvest fields are ready now. When you go out in your community, when you go out in, the, in wherever your life goes, you run into lost people, you're looking at white fields, you're looking at ready fields, you're looking at people that need to be saved now. You don't, they don't need to wait until they're 70 years old or so like that, no, but why? Because no man has the promise of tomorrow. We, that we should be helping people come to know Jesus now. The fields are white and they're white in the harvest and they're white now. I, I'm telling you, the heart of Jesus as he was there, was upon the harvesting of souls. He, 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 said, he said, lift up your eyes. And I'm asking you and I'm saying to me, let's lift up our eyes and look around and see what we can do. Are there things we can do? Are there things that the Lord would lead us to do? And the challenge of Jesus was this, to lift up your eyes and to look on the fields. The fields of souls are what, and, and, and they're ready for harvesting, you know when? Right now. They're ready right now. I want to encourage you. You might say, well, I don't know how to do that. I want to encourage you. If you're saved, you know for sure you're going to heaven. I want you to begin to ask God, God, how can I do that? So what can I do? What can I do? I, I'm preaching a message this morning that's going to challenge everybody here. Invitation time is going to challenge every one of you. There's not a one of you that will be challenged. I promise you, not a one of you that won't be challenged. You know why? Because it's important. Some people have this idea. Jesus, Jesus said in John 20, as he was getting ready to go back to heaven, he said, peace be unto you as he appeared to him. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. He sent the disciples out. Why? To win the world. And here's what I want you to notice. When Jesus went through Samaria, he had, what, what did he say in, 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 in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he said that you'll receive power upon you, you'll receive the Holy Spirit, you have power upon you to do what? To be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus started. In Judea, that's where Jesus went through, Judea, in order, and Samaria. And then, and then he went to the uttermost parts of the world. If you, if you study your Bible carefully, you'll find that some of the apostles went into India, some into other areas. You, you'll know that, that the apostle Peter was, was called to Cornelius, the first Gentile that we find being saved. We find here in, in Samaria that these half Jew and half uh, Gentile people were brought to the Lord here by this, by this unvirtuous woman was the one who witnessed to them. A woman who had been an adulteress she recognized who this is. And she went straight to town and went to Holland and telling him, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm going to take the pressure off of you. All you need to know is I've met the king. That's all you need to know. And let the Holy Spirit of God do the rest of the work in you and through you. So to tell somebody. Now a lot of us think that I have to be, that, I, that, that it, takes a, uh, it takes a spiritual crusade. It takes a big church across town. It takes a Billy Graham event or anything like that for people to come to know the Lord. But in a, in a, in a Barney, a research group, here's some research is what they found. They found that evangelism, friend, friendship evangelism, I've preached that for years. Friendship evangelism is the way majority of people come to know the Lord. 4% Sunday school, 4% through the death of a relative or friend. Personal evangelism by a pastor, 7%. We don't do very much in the pastorship. Event evangelism. Uh, youth camp, 
uh, evangelistic crusades, sermons like you're hearing this morning, 17%. But notice the big factor, friendship evangelism. What happened? I become acquainted with somebody and I developed a friendship with them. They saw Jesus in my life because the Holy Spirit was working and they received Christ because of the witness they saw in me. 44%. That's what, that's what I want us to notice this morning. So I'm telling you, the food should motivate us and the fields should motivate us because the fields are why. Not only that, the future, the future should motivate us. And boy, if there's anything that ought to motivate you, it ought to be the future. Some of you are planning for retirement and you've got 401ks and all this kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. This earth is not your final destination. And it's good to plan. It's good to do that. Don't, don't forsake it because when you get there, you'll be sorry if you didn't. I'm saying plan for that. But I'm telling you too, lay treasure in heaven while you're on your way. I'm saying lay treasure in heaven. Look, the future should motivate. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receives wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. When you're witnessing for Jesus, when you're reaching people, you, you are sowing in eternal life. You are part of eternal life coming into another person's life. You're part of that whole process. And I'm saying to you, it's important. I'm saying to you, it, it, really, it really should motivate us. It, it really should. He said, and gathereth fruit into eternal life that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice. Here's what that says. I've got several more, 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 more verses that I could use, but I'm, I'm, for, I'm not going to do that this morning. But as we, as we think about these things, I'm going to read one of those verses, which is Luke 6, 35. Notice what Jesus said. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend. Notice, hoping for nothing again. In other words, what I do, I do out of my heart. The love of God, don't expect a thing back in return. Most time when people does you a favor, they're expecting a favor back. But God, that's not the way of Jesus. Is and your reward shall be great. I'm talking to you about the reward. I'm talking to And ye shall be the children of the highest for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Do you have a heart that's kind to the unthankful and the evil? That question will really get to you right there. Because you're okay as long as everybody's good to you. If you let somebody be mean to you and then watch, watch your reaction. That'll show you how close you are to God. That'll tell you how much of the Spirit of God. And I'm not saying be a doormat. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there's a heart in you that loves the lost people. Why? Because that's the love and that's the life of Jesus. So uh, with that said, there's, we can draw two conclusions from the future should motivate us. Here's what it is. That no witness given is ever wasted. And no witness we ever give is ever worthless. Here, the witness that you do is not wasted and it's not worthless. You say, well, I, that nothing didn't happen. It wasn't wasted and it wasn't worthless. You may be planting seed. Somebody else may come by and do some more seed planting. Somebody might come in water and water. First thing you know, somebody's going to reap. There'll be times when you're the one that reaps where somebody else has sowed. That's all God's business. But the reward is ours as we grow up together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. If you notice on our church bulletin, that, past, that, past, that, that verse of scripture is on our church bulletin. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I am praying that Biltmore Baptist Church raise up people in our congregation and around our community who will be soul winners. Why? Because the laborers are few. And I hope God just burns up in our hearts that plants put some, some, something in your heart and mind that will cause you to, to honor him and, and to do it and realize that there's fields out there that needs to be harvested. And I'm doing it because I know the future ahead of me looks good. I, in my mind's eye, I see myself 500 years down the road. And here's what I can't do. 
I can't testify enough. I can't preach enough. I can't pray enough. Why? Because I know there's a heaven awaiting and I know it's glorious. I know that there's rewards for everything. Yeah, listen, when you're going to heaven, you're not going to sit around on a little puffy cloud and look pretty. God's got work for you to do there. And there's, and, and see, according to what your faith is now and what you accomplish here, probably there's reward. Now, there'll be no, everybody's going to be happy in heaven. There'll be no sadness in heaven, no tears there. So everything's going to be good. But I'm telling you, there are a degree. And I'm encouraging you, why not lay treasure in heaven? 401k goes up and down if you don't think so. Just look, here, a little, here uh, over a couple of years ago, I took some money out where the wife had in her retirement when she changed jobs. And, and the, the market was like, uh, at, at that time, I think was about 1300 or 1350 And I thought, this thing's getting ready to crash. So I talked her into pulling that money out and let's put it where it'd be safe. And so we did. And now the market's 1900 and better. So see, I lost money trying to be conservative. Uh, but at the same time, it could crash. Uh, but anyway, it ain't going to crash in heaven. That's what I'm trying to say. So let's lay, let's lay it in heaven. In conclusion this morning, you might ask, what can I do to further God's kingdom? Here, here, here's, here's what I say to you. You can draw near to God. Some of you need to draw near to God. You know it, and I do too. I need to draw near to God. I want to draw near to God and to do His will. Nothing should motivate you more than doing the will of God. You can look for opportunity. You'll say, how do I do that? Well, just uh, be observant. When you recognize that voice inside, be, be observant. Don't be backward. Don't be afraid. Tell people about the love of Jesus. And let God use you. You're a personality. And, and you, 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 he can use you in that way. I will also say that you can pray. Pray for your community. Pray for the county, the region, the national level. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor by all means. Lift up each other and pray fervently and continuously and let God be God in our lives. I'll ask you this morning, as we enter invitation time, I'll ask you to stand and